Okay, this is chapter 17, so reproductive. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at uh, reproductive system. So one of the things about the reproductive system is that its job is to produce the gametes. So that's eggs and sperm. Um, and so in uh, females, they also have an entire system um, that kind of protects the eggs and, and nourishes them and develops them. Whereas in males, it's kind of the sperm production is a bit more of a batchwise process. You make a ton, you get, you lose it, or you use it or lose it, and then you just make another batch. So it's a little bit different strategy uh, between the two uh, individuals, the two sexes. So the reproductive organs are going to be composed of certainly the genitals um, in the males. The sperm product producing organs are gonna be the testes and the females, it's the ovaries. That's where you're gonna find the eggs themselves. Um, and then um, typically the sperm will um, basically move through ducts in the male system, whereas the female will transport eggs through uterine, uterine tubes or fallopian tubes and then ultimately move those eggs to the uterus where the baby would develop. And so in addition to this, the structure associated with the male and female delivery, obviously the male penis is what delivers the sperm to the vagina. Um, and the vagina or the birth canal, oftentimes what it's referred to, is also the conduit for uh, menstrual shedding um, and um, also the transport of the baby well, once the baby is born. <clears throat> and so the uterus, however, is kind of where development begins. So the fertilized egg will make its way to the uterus and then it'll develop in the uterus. And then after that, so the mother's system will develop nourishment to the fetus um, in the uterus. And then after birth, then the mother's milk will provide nourishment to the baby. And so both of the sex organs, both the testes and the ovaries will produce sex hormones. And so the se male sex hormone will masculinize tissue and the female uh, sex hormone will feminize the tissue. And that usually happens um, in the male and female body at puberty. And so this is basically uh, where the hormones start to um, kick in and that sexual maturity begins to um, begins to start. And then generally speaking, uh, between 10 and 14 for girls, 12 and 16 for boys, um, that's usually uh, when the sex hormones hit and starts to masculinize the body, starts transforming males and females from little boys and girls into men and women. And so ultimately you will have a, a adult body that is capable of sexual reproduction. And that's kind of the point. <clears throat> now, within all of this story, uh, the reproductive system is the actual process of being able to reproduce. And to, in order to really talk about the ability to reproduce, you have to go back to cell cycle, which is essentially the transmission of DNA from one generation to the next. That uh, happens in mitosis and also in meiosis. And so in each one of our cells in our body, we have 46 chromosomes. It's called our diploid number. Um, and so we have 23 pairs one coming from each parent. That's the reason why we have 46. Now in mitosis, what you're basically looking to do is duplicate an identical copy of the cell that you start with. So for instance, what's gonna happen here with mitosis is you're gonna go from a cell with 46 chromosomes and you're gonna divide that into two identical cells of 46 chromosomes. And so as a result, for the building of your body and also for growth and repair of damaged tissues when you need to replace old worn out cells or cells that have been damaged. And so this is kind of what it looks like. So if we start off with the zygote stage, that is the single cell stage, which is called the diploid stage. So diploid basically means that you have two sets of every chromosome. And so from the zygote stage, you're gonna go through multiple rounds of um, mitosis. And that's gonna create your diploid body where all of your cells have two copies of each of the chromosomes. And then of course you'll grow up, continue to grow 
into your diploid adult body, so the male and the female body, and then a subset of cells in the male and the female will be set aside to produce the sex cells, and those will go through meiosis. So that's a diploid going to what's called a haploid. So haploid essentially means that you have only one set of chromosomes. And so our haploid would basically be 23. So we go from um, diploid, 46 chromosomes, down to 23 chromosomes. And that's basically where we form the sperm with 23 chromosomes in it, and the egg and females with 23 chromosomes in it. And then on fertilization, the sperm will join its chromosomes to the female egg, and then that will reconstitute the zygote where you get your diploid number back. And so in meiosis, this is basically a cell division, also similar to mitosis. Only the difference is in mitosis, you're building a body, right? So you're basically making more of the same. But in meiosis, this is specifically for reproduction. As a matter of fact, the products of meiosis are essentially four haploid genetically non-identical cells. <laughs> And this is only happening in the testes in males and the ovaries in females. That's the only place. So it's a very limited locality. Now, unlike mitosis, meiosis has um, two different stages to it. So one is called the first one in meiosis one is what's called the um, called the reduction division. So that's in meiosis one. So this is your reduction division. And the second one, it's basically what's called the equational division. And so called because in meiosis one, you're going from a diploid to a haploid at the end of meiosis one. And in meiosis two, you're going from a haploid to a haploid, so you stay the same, that's why you're equational. So in meiosis, you're going to go from a diploid down to a haploid, so it's been reduced. And then basically, those haploid cells will become your gametes or your sex cells, your sperm, and your eggs. And this also is a mechanism for creating a lot of genetic variation so that you have a lot of variation to deal with. So these haploid cells will then ultimately turn into sperm in males, or it'll turn into eggs in females. And so once you fuse the two together, 23 plus 23 equals 46, which is what gives you your diploid number for the zygote. So ultimately, if you didn't have meiosis, that's the reduction, then every single time you go through generation, your DNA would double, right? Go from 46 to 92 and so forth. And so you have to separate them or reduce them down in order to stay the same. So you double and then have. Right, and so that would be pretty functionless at some point. So we would not work very well genetically as a genetic system if that were the case. So let's go ahead and focus in on the male reproductive system and then we'll kind of follow it up with the female reproductive system. So in the male reproductive system, so we have some of the major components, the testes. Um, these are basically the gonads. The gonad is basically more of a general term for the reproductive organs. So, these are the primary sex organs of the male. The testes themselves will be encased in a scrotum, which is a sac-like structure that basically wraps around the testes. The epididymis is a portion that's just on top It's on top of a testicle. And this is basically where the sperm would mature. So you go through meiosis in the testis, and then you move to the epididymis for finishing, redevelop into a mature sperm. And the vas deferens is basically the duct or the tube that the sperm passes through. Um, and so it'll go through um, the duct then to the urethra for delivery. And so this is just kind of like a little table of some of the major structures. So we have testes, the epididymis, uh, the vas deferens, which is uh, the conduction piece, the seminal vesicles, which typically provide nutrients. These are 
different types of glands that are inside the male body. Um, they'll add nutrients and they'll also add fluid uh, to the semen for delivery of the cells from where the sperm are just cells. They need fluid to swim in. The prostate gland will also add fluid to the, se to the semen. The urethra will provide the conduction for the um, sperm to exit the body and the bulbar urethral glands um, will add kind of more of a mucousy type of fluid um, to the system as well. So this is kind of what it looks like. So here you can see a cross section of the penis. So you can see the penis itself. It's composed of several different uh, components. So you have the foreskin, which is a flap of skin that covers the tip of the penis or the glands penis. And inside the structure of the penis, you're going to have the urethra, which is the opening canal that basically allows the sperm to pass through. And then you see the erectile tissue, different types of erectile tissue, which is essentially will engorge with blood and then stiffen in order to um, um, for uh, copulation and delivery <clears throat> in the penis itself. As you kind of go into the body itself, you're going to notice that the urethra is connected to the bulbal urethral gland or that's adding fluids and it passes through the prostate gland. So this large structure right here, the prostate gland, it's basically adding different types of, um, of fluids to the semen itself. And then it also passes right by the seminal vesicle, which is also adding fluids. And so this is basically um, where you have the vast deferens. So you can see the vast deferens is this large tubular structure that kind of wraps around, goes out of the body into the scrotum, and then basically attaches to the base of the epididymis. So you can see the epididymis here is this little structure that's sitting right on top of the testicle, and then all of your tubular pieces in the testicle itself is where a lot of that meiosis is happening in the actual penis itself. And so this is kind of like a cutaway view of it um, where you can see um, the passage of the um, vas deferens as it comes through, and then it basically collects all these uh, fluids on its way out of the body. So during ejaculation, basically what's going to happen is sperm is um, delivered, so it's going to leave the penis. Um, now the fluid portion is what we refer to as the semen. And that's typically the secretions of the seminal vesicles, the prostate gland, and the bulbar urethral gland. So the three of those together will form the semen, which is what the, the cells are suspended in. Remember, sperm are modal cells, so they basically have to be able to swim up the female reproductive tract in order to fertilize the egg. And so in order to do that, you have them suspended in fluid, and that's what the semen is there for. The prostate gland, which typically surrounds the urethra, is generally just below the bladder. So as it enlarges, it can squeeze off the urethra, creating a feeling of urgency. Um, and so that's kind of where you have that growing prostate problem. Um, the semen or the seminal fluid um, is actually composed of a couple of different things. First of all, it's a little on the basic side. And uh, the reason why it's a little on the basic side is because the fluids inside the vagina are a little on the acidic side. So it's kind of like neutralizes the fluids in the vagina itself. It also contains fructose as an energy source for the mitochondria. That allows the sperm to move its tail. So it's also got prostaglandins in it as well. Um, and so what this does is the prostaglandins will cause the uterus to um, contract and it kind of squeezes the sperm toward the egg. So it kind of helps the egg or helps the sperm rather in its motility. So the penis is basically the sexual intercourse um, organ. And so this has the urethra in it, which is also connected to the urinary system, which is different than in the female. And so the long shaft is tipped by the gland's penis, which is erectile tissue, um, and it gets engorged with blood. The foreskin is a little bit of skin layer that covers the gland's penis. Now during circumcision, typically you'll remove a portion of the foreskin so you don't have as you don't have that flap basically over the gland's penis. <clears throat> 
And so this will be done for several different reasons. There's originally it was done for religious reasons, um, but now there's also health benefits that are associated with it. People will do health benefits. It's easier to keep track, uh, keep clean. Oftentimes an uncircumcised individual will have to deal with urinary tract infections. Um, and so this is something that typically doesn't happen in circumcised males, but in uncircumcised males, it can be a higher risk for urinary tract infections and things of that nature. And that's mostly because bacteria can kind of hide in those little folds of the foreskin. So the penis is basically um, spongy erectile tissue that essentially will distend. Um, and so ultimately during arousal, the autonomic nervous system will secrete nitric oxide. And this will basically um, create um, the kind of the erectile function so typically what happens is once nitric oxide sets in, this will create a molecule called um, cyclic guanosine monophosphate, so it's G, a CGMP. And so it's very similar to ATP as an energy source. Um, but what it does, is it acts on smooth muscle, uh, which oftentimes is in the reproductive organs of the male. And um, the arterial walls, which are in the penis itself to relax. And so what happens is it engorges with blood. It releases the blood. So the effect of all this is the end effect is to release blood into the erectile tissue. And when blood gets uh, released in the erectile tissue, it tends to harden up. So that's actually what causes the hardness is the blood flow into the actual erectile tissue. This is kind of what it looks like here. You can see the opening to the urethra. Down here, the glands penis, which is the tip um, of the penis itself. You can see the folds of the foreskin that basically cover that tip. And then inside, you can see is erectile tissue laced with nerves and blood vessels all the way throughout. And these are the blood vessels that uh, we take a look at. So this is kind of like um, an image of it as well, a cross section. <clears throat> so typically um, underneath, you're going to have a kind of a large sort of a structure that is essentially uh, going to hold the urethra. And then above that are going to be these erectile tissues. And so these erectile tissues will be the areas that will engorge um, creating the erection, and then above that, you have a couple of veins, the dorsal vein, which is above, and the dorsal arteries, which are next to it, that basically creates the vasculature of the penis itself. And so the veins will take the blood away from the penis, um, and then um, and then as the penis starts to um, experience blood rush into the tissue, it will become erect. So the blood will be going from the arterial system into the erectile tissue and then out through the veins as it is taken away. So at this particular point, a sphincter will close off the bladder so that you the at this particular point urine will not come through the urethra. So you kind of you kind of close that close that down. So basically this is the mechanism as we understand it of um, male erection. Now, ED, or erectile dysfunction, or impotency, as it used to be called, is essentially the ability to either create or maintain an erection. And oftentimes, we can track this to poor blood flow. Um, some medications can do this, and certain illnesses can do it. So it can either be caused by nerve damage or oftentimes blood flows. Like, for instance, uh, individuals with uh, cardiovascular problems, blood flow issues, oftentimes may also experience ED as a sort of a secondary um, cause or a secondary issue. And so some medica uh, medications will actually block this, this mechanism um, of uh, cyclic GMP, um, and that will cause uh, a foul up in the normal vascularization. So basically when you get to the point of orgasm, um, what this basically is, is just a nervous response where um, the musculature of the penis will begin to increase and um, the sperm will enter the urethra uh, from the vas deferens and then the um, 
the semen, which is secreted from the three glands. So you're basically adding uh, the fluid to the sperm as it sort of comes through. And then now what you have in the urethra is seminal fluid with the sperm in there as well. And then ultimately the muscles will contract, you have muscle, muscular contraction, which will then eject it from the penis. And so this will basically create um, that, that orgasm, which is essentially the delivery of the sperm itself. And every mammal um, does this. Every mammal has the same, the same mechanism. So normally in males, after the delivery of the orgasm, what happens is the, the penis will return to its normal flaccid or limp state uh, where you have what's called a refractory period, an insensitive period. Um, and so what this basically means is it's, it's not listening to further stimulation. And so this period of time will increase as you get older. So typically after delivery, um, it's normal uh, for the penis to, to deflate essentially or to go back down. So generally speaking with each delivery, you get roughly three and a half to four milliliters of semen or, uh, on, or more than a hundred million sperm. So there's lots of sperm that are coming out all at once. Um, even if it's low, all you need is one sperm to do fertilization. And that's the whole idea, right? So you put out a lot of different sperm because you don't know which ones are going to make it and which ones aren't. This basically ensures that essentially you're going to get fertilization. Now, the testes basically um, will begin in the male inside the body, inside the abdominal cavity. And then what will happen is during development, they'll descend into the scrotum um, at the, at the very end of fetal development in the last couple of months, in months eight and nine. So the testes will descend and then they'll basically um, exit the body, they'll be external to the body. Now, what happens if the testes don't descend? If they don't, then typically it'll result, result in male sterility, which is the ability to not produce um, offspring. And that usually is what happens. So the internal body temperature, the reason why the testes descend and become external is because um, the testes are very temperature sensitive. As a matter of fact, the normal spermatogenesis, the ability to make sperm in males is temperature sensitive. And the internal temperatures are just too high to produce viable sperm. And so what happens is the scrotum basically will exit the body. And then that way you can regulate the body temperature or the temperature of the scrotum in order to keep the temperature of spermatogenesis exactly where you want it. And this is also one of the reasons why oftentimes in the scrotum, there, depending on whether you're like in a cold area or a cold pool, uh, sometimes the testicles will kind of pull up next to the body and sometimes they'll kind of hang free. Um, and that's because what's happening is you can pull them up close to the body to get warmer temperatures, um, or you can basically move them further away from the body in order to reduce the temperature. So you can regulate the temperature of spermatogenesis. And this is something that's very specific to spermatogenesis in males. Now, inside the testes are what's called seminiferous tubules. So the testes is basically um, divided up into subsections called lobules. And those lobules are made out of tubular-like structures called seminiferous tubules. This is where spermatogenesis is happening. So spermatogenesis is essentially the production of sperm. That's what's happening there. So it's a meiotic process. It begins with a type of stem cell called a spermatogonia. So spermatogonia will divide to create what's called the primary spermatocytes. These are the diploid cells that will undergo meiosis. Right? And so what they do is they go through meiosis one and they create what's called the secondary spermatocytes. So this is after meiosis one and before meiosis two. Then what happens is the sperm, secondary spermatocytes will undergo the rest of meiosis two, and they'll create the four spermatids, which are the four haploid products. And so each of them has 23 chromosomes. This is kind of what it looks like. So here you can see the different lobules of the actual testis itself in these little tubular-like structures, looks like spaghetti of the seminiferous tubules that are all coiled up inside the testis itself. Notice, however, that each of these little lobules is connected to the epididymis where 
the unfinished spermatids will go to be developed into full mature sperm. Then from there, it's going to move, as it finishes, it's going to move through the epididymis and into the vast deferens where it'll be delivered into the body for delivery. And so this is kind of what an, a, a histological graph of what an actual cross-section of a seminiferous tubule looks like. So this is one tubule. So this whole structure right here, I'm going to do it in red. So this whole structure right here, this is basically one seminiferous tubule. And so what happens is on the outer edge up here, you basically have these spermatogonia. Those are the stem cells. Then as you start to move in, you start to get into these primary spermocytes, spermatocytes, and the secondary spermatocytes. And then here you have the spermatids, which are in the lumen of the spermatogonium. So basically, meiosis is proceeding from the outside in. Okay, so once you have the spermatids, right, these are basically the haploid cells. Um, then you can move those and mature those into sperm, give them a tail and a head, and they're ready for delivery. Now, Sertoli cells, which are cells that are kind of interspersed in the um, seminiferous tubule, they're there for support. So they're support cells, they're nourishing cells, they help to sort of move spermatogenesis along. Um, and it takes about, so to go from one spermatogonia to a sperm mm -hmm. takes about 74 days or so. So you're just kind of constantly making sperm. The average male is just constantly making sperm. So it's not like, you know, you don't have, you know, it's 74 days and then you have nothing and you have to wait for 74 days before you have more sperm. You're constantly making sperm. It's a constant process because you're constantly adding um, to this process. So that's kind of what it looks like. So this is what it looks like, a cartoon version of what I kind of wrote before. So you have your spermatogonium, which is diploid. And so it's going to go through meiosis because one of the things it does is it replaces itself. Right? Spermatogonium is a stem cell. And so what stem cells do is they basically replace themselves first. So this becomes a new spermatogonium. And then this one will then go on and go through meiosis. So when it goes through meiosis, it's going to basically reduce itself into two. That's the secondary um, spermatocyte. And then this is going to go through meiosis two, where you're going to form your spermatids. And the spermatids will then grow ahead. They'll start to mature and get their mature tail. And then they'll be modal. And they'll be ready to head off to the epididymis for finishing. So you have three uh, parts to a sperm cell, the headpiece, the middle piece, and the tail. Now, typically, because they're modal, they need mitochondria. This is going to be in the middle piece, and it provides energy to the tail so it can actually move. The head part is uh, covered by what's called an acrosome, and this contains enzymes that it needs in order to penetrate the egg. So basically, this is what it looks like. So your acrosome is up here at the top. It's the crown. The middle piece is here, which has the mitochondria. Matter of fact, if you blow that up, what you would see is you would see the tail with all these mitochondria next to it, providing energy to the tail so that you have energy to be able to move your tail. And in addition to that, you also have interstitial cells, which are basically plugged in between the seminiferous tubules. So these are basically interstitial. Interstitial means inter in between the cells. Now these guys are important because these are making androgens, in particular testosterone. And this is the masculinizing hormone that will basically masculinize ma male tissue. So in addition to this, the hormonal control of males. So we have testosterone that is clearly a hormone. So it's a steroid hormone, it's still a hormone. 
but you also have coming from the hypothalamus, which uh, we learned about the region in our brain, is going to be making what's called gonadotropin releasing hormone or GNRH. And this is a hormone which will stimulate follicle stimulating hormone FSH and luteinizing hormone LH. Now in males, follicle stimulating hormone basically supports the production of sperm and is a hormonal regulator to, to help manage the production of sperm. LH, however, in males will stimulate the production of testosterone. And so ultimately both of these are controlled by the negative feedback. What this basically means is that the more production of sperm and testosterone you have, they can feed back and kind of close this down to sort of slow it down. So ultimately you have a constant production of sperm and testosterone in males once they hit that testosterone production in puberty. And this is kind of what it looks like. So remember from the top, the hypothalamus, which is making gonadotropin releasing hormone, it's gonna be sending that ultimately <clears throat> um, through the pituitary, the anterior pituitary, which is then going to be making luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone, sending that to the testes. And so follicle stimulating hormone will be helping with the production of sperm and then luteinizing hormone will be working with the production of testosterone. And the more of this you make, the more it can feed back on both the pituitary and the hypothalamus to control. Either it can inhibit it if it's making too much or it can upregulate it if it needs more. And so this kind of keeps an ongoing regular um, system of, of hormones. So follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone is important in males as well. Now, testosterone, which is basically concerning our male sex hormone, this is critical for male sex organ development. As a matter of fact, this is what masculinizes um, male body tissue. And so your secondary male sex characteristics are developed at puberty. Um, and so the things that we associate with males, for instance, males being taller, um, broader shoulders, longer legs, for instance, deeper voices, all of those um, are all masculinized tissues that are associated with testosterone, muscle mass, bone mass, things of that nature. So hair growth on the face, chest regions, right? Your receding hairline is also a male thing. It's associated with testosterone and muscular development. So the bulkier, thicker um, musculature of a male, that's all under the direction of testosterone. And so that masculinizes the male body. Okay, so that's the male reproductive system. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the female reproductive system. So what's happening here now is um, activities that are going to be happening in the ovaries. This is your the female gonad to the female reproductive organs. So in the pelvic cavity, there are like little shallow depressions where the ovaries kind of settle down into and one on each side. And their job is to produce eggs. We also call them ova or, o or, or ovules. Um, the sex hormones for females is estrogen and progesterone. And so those are really important key um, hormones in the production of the female reproductive system. So our ovaries is basically where we're going to have the production of our eggs. We also have sex hormones coming from the ovaries as well. In addition to that, we have the uterine tubes, which is going to be the conduction pathway for the eggs. And also, this is the locality of fertilization where fertilization occurs. The uterus is specifically designed for fetal development. That's basically where you have the fetus essentially developing. And then the cervix is basically opening to the uterus. And the vaginal canal is essentially the area of sperm delivery. It's also the birth canal and the opening for menstrual flow. So this is basically where we have the female. So ultimately, on the exterior of the female's body, you will have the opening to the uh, vagina, so the vaginal opening. Around that, you'll have flaps of skin called the labia minora and the labia majora. Um, and so above that, you'll have the opening of the urethra, uh, which connects to the bladder. But from the vagina, you'll have the vaginal canal. And then as you go deep into the vaginal canal, you'll get to the entrance of the uterus where you see the cervix. And then, of course, this large muscular pouch would be the uterus itself. Now, attached to the uterus is going to be the ovary structure. So you can see you have this stalk-like component with this little tubular system that connects actually to the uterus itself. 
So this is the uterine tube or the fallopian tube, the oviduct sometimes it's referred to. It wraps around and connects with the ovary, which is this white structure right here. This is where the meiosis is happening in the females and where uh, the female's uh, meiosis is occurring. Now, a couple of other features that you're gonna notice in the female it's, uh, as well. You'll notice that the um, anal opening is just right behind the vagina where you have basically the rectum kind of moving up in that direction. And then just above the urethra, there is a piece of tissue that is actually ligamentedly, ligament. There's a ligament that's attaching the structure to the pubic bone. This is the clitoris, which is also erectile tissue. So the erectile tissue, like in we saw in males, which becomes engorged in blood, uh, is basically the erectile tissue for females. So if we take a look at the female, the uterine tubes, the oviducts and the fallopian tubes, basically, um, you go by both terms. Um, in, any of the three is sufficient. So these will go from the uterus to the ovaries themselves. Now, ultimately, they're not attached to the ovaries. They're just kind of overlaying them. So you have finger-like fimbrae, these little projections. Um, that's what these little finger-like projections are. So these little fimbrae are finger-like projections. And so they basically rest over the um, ovaries themselves. And so what happens is during ovulation, when an egg is extruded, the fimbrae will sweep the egg into the uterine tube like a collection. So it'll just kind of sweep it in. And then inside the uterine tube, the egg will basically be moved along by ciliary movement towards the uterus. So ultimately an egg, once it's ovulated, will live for about six to 24 hours. Um, and so uh, this is where fertilization will take place in the uterine tube. And so once that fertilization occurs, then embryonic development will begin and it tumbles down the uterine tube or the fallopian tube and then will implant itself in the uterus after several days and it'll embed itself into that uterine lining where it'll continue its development. Now the uterus itself is a muscular organ. It's very thick walled, it's very vascular as well. So the uterine tube will basically join to the uterus at its upper end. Um, at the lower end, the cervix is open to the vagina to receive the sperm. And so ultimately cervical cancer is oftentimes, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's a cancer of this particular area. It's a common cancer in, in some women. And so a pap screen or a pap test is essentially where you remove a couple of cells from the cervical area um, to take a look at them microscopically to see whether or not they're showing signs of any kind of cancerous growth or development. In a hysterectomy, this is basically the surgical removal, either partial or total, of the uterus itself. If the uterus starts to become uh, a little bit of a problem. And an ovario hysterectomy is basically the removal of both the uterus and the ovaries. So pretty much you're taking everything out. Now, in the uterus, you have multiple linings. So the first and the innermost is the endometrial lining. And this is probably the most important liner because this is the one that's gonna be supplying nutrients that's needed for embryonic and fetal development. So the fetus is basically gonna implant in the endometrium. And that's basically where it's gonna get its nutrients from. And it has two different layers in the endometrium. The first one is called the functional layer. This is basically the area that becomes very vascular and it gets shed every month during menstrual um, shedding. And then that rests on top of um, a, a, a non-replaceable layer called the basal layer. So this is basically an area of reproducing cells. So what happens is under the correct form of the uh, the basal layer will constantly rebuild a functional layer on top of it in anticipation of implantation. And then once fertilization does not occur, then you eliminate that functional layer and you start it all over again. And so depending on where you are in the cycle, that functional layer will have varying thicknesses associated with where that is. So that's kind of your normal uterus cycle is the functional layer will build up from the basal layer and get thicker and thicker and thicker in anticipation of implantation. If there's no fertilization event then, then that maintenance of that inner liner does not maintain and then basically detaches and then sloughs off. And then you redo it all over again the next month. So when you take a look at the genital tract, we start off with essentially a focal lining. And so this is basically the reception of um, obviously the, the purpose of sperm delivery and it's also the birth canal.
if we heard Obi comes out, it's also the X4.4 menstrual flow. Um, and so because it's an opening into the body, it's subject to bacterial. Um, um, and you, different types of pathogenic infections as well. But because it has bacteria in the vagina, which is normal. Remember, bacteria comes as a normal complement and also as a pathogenic. So this is normal. It's going to create an acidic environment, which is essentially why semen is basic in nature, because it helps to neutralize that environment. And so this acidic environment will help to reduce the pathogenic bacteria from growing. It creates a bit more of a hostile environment so the bacteria doesn't grow. And so the basic environment of the semen um, will um, <clears throat> will kind of help neutralize some of this so that uh, the sperm can, can get to where it needs to get. So some of the external portions of the female, so the vulva, which essentially is a generic term, is for the external genitals of the female, of which um, specifically is composed of the labia majora. So this is typically um, a larger flap of skin, hair covered typically. Um, and then over the pubic bone is what's called the mons pubis, which is kind of like a fat pad that overlies the pubic bone. Um, and so this is kind of like the upper region. So this is uh, kind of what it looks like. So here you can see the urethral opening and then above that is going to be the clitoris. And then below that is going to be the opening to the vagina. And then you have the um, labia minora, which is a small flap of tissue. And then the labia majora, which is a, a larger outer flap um, of tissue in the, um, in the female. So the labia minora is a small one. It's just basically inside the labia majora. And so this is kind of like the foreskin of the clitoris. So it's kind of like a skin-like structure that covers up the organs, similar to what we have in males. Um, and so this is uh, the glens uh, clit clitoris is um, the arousal structure in females. And so it is the female's erectile tissue. And this is the one that becomes engorged with blood, very similar in nature, kind of synonymous, very similar to uh, the penis in males. So then there's a little bit of a cleft between the labia minora um, and the urethra. And so that's going to be basically compose or contain the urethra and the vagina. Um, they're not the same. They're just basically the one above um, the other. Um, and so ultimately, um, sometimes early on, the vagina may be partially closed by a ring of tissue called the hymen. Um, and this is um, oftentimes uh, true in younger females. Uh, the urinary production females are entirely separate, whereas in males, they're combined, right? So basically you have uh, the urethra carries only urine, and so it exits out the urethra, and the vagina uh, is only the birth canal. So they are separated, whereas in the males, they are combined together. Now then, when you take a look at orgasm in females, um, the uh, labia minora, and the vaginal wall and the clitoris become engorged with blood. Uh, the breasts will swell, the nipples will become erect. Um, and so ultimately what will happen is everything will kind of redden and swell um, and kind of spread away from the vaginal. And now fluid will basically seep into the, vag the vagina to lubricate it. Um, and so that's kind of where the lubrication comes from. And then ultimately um, you have kind of general secretion of, of structures in this particular area that will continue to provide and create um, lubrication. And so this is an area um, that is kind of basically getting lubricated. And the idea is for the entry of the penis to make um, copulation and um, insertion of the penis easier because the idea is to reproduce here. <clears throat> 
And so that's kind of um, one of the reasons for the, uh, the lubrication is to increase uh, the entry and the delivery. Um, at this particular point, the clitoris is also becoming very sensitive. Um, and so it'll get, it gets uh, larger. And so ultimately, um, as, um, as uh, copulation is occurring, then what happens is you get pressure pushed against the pubic synthesis and that pushes up against the clitoris. So um, ultimately blood pressure and pulse rate will rise, breathing quickens, um, the uterus will contract rhythmically. And the idea there is that as uh, the semen and the sperm is being delivered, the idea is that'll, that rhythmic contraction of the uterus, and the uterine tubes will kind of help uh, facilitate the, the delivery or the motility of the sperm. And then of course you get the pleasure, the intense pleasure. Um, and then um, in females, in my tails, um, there's no refractory period. And so, um, they can, they don't have to um, kind of go through that refractory period. So that's a little bit different. So now let's go ahead and take a look at the ovarian cycle. So oogenesis. So we took a look at spermatogenesis in males. Now let's go ahead and take a look at how an egg is developed in females. And there's a little bit more going on in females uh, than in males. So first of all, uh, the one thing we want to uh, clear up is our terminology. So the oocytes essentially is um, the oocyte, sorry about that, is the immature egg. And it's typically enclosed, uh, I was going to do that, sorry. Um, and the oocyte is contained in with, within what's called a follicle. And so the oocyte is the egg, that's the, the cell that goes through meiosis, right? And then the follicle is basically the cells from the mother. And these guys are there to help support the egg. So generally speaking, female, every female has all the eggs that she will ever have. <clears throat> Some 2 million or so follicles. Um, and so um, about 400-ish or so will typically mature. Uh, and so you only, re you only produce one egg per month during the reproductive years of the female. And so ultimately, as the follicle matures during what's called the ovarian cycle, it'll change from a primary oocyte to a secondary oocyte to a testicular. And so we want to take a look at each one of these. So in the primary follicle, what happens is you have epithelial surround cells surrounding a primary oocyte. And so a primary oocyte can be seen as an individual cell, and you'll have these follicle cells that basically form a, a circular kind of structure around it. So that's basically what a kind of looks like. Then in a secondary oocyte, follicular fluid starts to surround a secondary oocyte. So what happens is you have your oocyte here like this, and then you start to have multiple layers around the egg. But some of these layers, they start to blister and they start to form little openings that fill with follicular fluid. Yeah. Those are secondary. And the vesicular uh, follicle has an expansion of this fluid filled space. And so they look something more like this. So here's your follicle on the side. What a particular one looks like. You can see this large region filled with follicular fluid. And this is kind of what they look like. So you start off with primary follicles. So you can see like very small follicles just surrounded by cells. As you move into the secondary, you're going to start to see some thicker cells, thicker follicle cells around the actual itself. And then an opening space 
And then once you get to the vesicular, you can see a much larger open area where your egg is kind of off to the side. So this is like a vesicular or a graphian image of a cell here. And so the reason why these are important <clears throat> is because what happens is once they vesiculate like this, then what's going to happen is the egg itself is going to be extruded as a secondary oocyte covered by cells. And it's going to leave behind what's called the corpus luteum, which is all the rest of those follicular cells. And so they oftentimes will secrete progesterone and a little bit of estrogen, but a lot of progesterone. And so they'll develop into this large secretory body that produces progesterone. And then eventually they will deteriorate in what's called the corpus albicans. This is when it stops secreting progesterone. And now it's done. And so that's basically what's happening inside the, um, the ovary. This is the production of the oocyte. The primary oocyte will basically undergo meiosis one. And the two resulting cells are haploid. Now, the important thing to understand is that the oocytes are arrested in meiosis one. And once they're called up every month, they finish meiosis one. And then they arrest in meiosis two. So one of these cells is called the polar body. We only choose one of these cells to be the egg. The other one becomes what's called the polar body. And so this is essentially going to hold the chromosomes. And then what happens is as it tends to mature, it's going to basically um, go through meiosis two. So the secondary oocyte is working on meiosis two. Um, and so it arrests in meiosis two. So it never completes meiosis if it never gets fertilized, dies shortly thereafter, and then it's released. So that's kind of what it looks like. So the primary oocyte will basically arrest. It's arrested in meiosis one at the very beginning. So when you're born, you're arrested in meiosis one. Then what happens is you finish meiosis one and um, and then you rest in meiosis two. I'm trying to figure out this. And then what happens is once you're fertilized, that causes you to finish meiosis two. You finish it, you fuse with the male nucleus, and then you become the zygote. And then the other, the one, the cells that you don't pick are just basically what's called polar bodies. So you just don't use them. So then from the vesicular follicle, you basically extrude, kind of squeeze out the oocyte, that's ovulation. Um, and then the structure left behind, the follicle cells will become the corpus luteum, which becomes a gland-like structure um, the, um, the corpus luteum eventually will disintegrate. So it doesn't last for, for forever. And then eventually it's going to, um, stop producing progesterone. So the primary follicle will basically produce, um, progesterone. Um, the secondary follicle will produce progesterone and some progesterone, I mean, it's estrogen. And the secondary follicle will produce some estrogen and some progesterone. And the corpus luteum will produce mostly progesterone and a little bit of estrogen. Where estrogen is kind of like maintaining a lot of this. So like in males, right, in females, hypothalamus is making gonadotropin uh, releasing hormone. This will also cause FSH and LSLH to be released. Only in this case, in females, it's basically driving the ovarian cycle, right? So FSH and LH will basically come in and will stimulate progesterone development and estrogen development, which will then feed back on the pituitary and the hypothalamus, both of them. So very similar to males, only in this case, um, FSH is basically going to be um, driving this development of the primary follicle, which is primarily secreting estrogen. And as estrogen rises, and we're going to see a graph of this in just a second, but as estrogen rises, it basically creates a negative feedback 
on the anterior pituitary and the secretion of FSH, which ends the follicular phase, but stops it because of negative feedback. The LH coming basically is triggering the ovulation. So the ovulation event um, of a 28-day cycle, so day 14 of a 28-day cycle, is triggered by the LH. So you have a follicular developer, and then you have an ovulator with LH. So the luteal phase, basically, of the ovarian cycle is basically where you get the development of the corpus luteum. So after ovulation, then LH will, will stimulate the development of corpus luteum, which will start to secrete lots of progesterone. And so typically speaking, if there is no fertilization, then typically it will regress and a new cycle will begin. So this is what I'm going to <coughs> So we're going to start off with the primary follicle right here. So FSH is secreted, which is going to develop the follicle into primary, the secondary, into mature follicle. And then LH is going to come in to stimulate the ovulation. Now notice what's happening at this particular point in both the hormones of estrogen and progesterone as LH and FSH. So estrogen and progesterone are basically kind of staying at an even keel. So generally speaking, you'll have menstruation, and then you'll have the beginning of a new follicle development while you're finishing out the menstruation. So what happens then as the mature follicle begins to move in and LH begins to kick in, you start to get an uptick in estrogen, not so much in progesterone, but the estrogen is going to start to reignite the thickening of that functional layer of the uterine line of the endometrial lining. Then at ovulation, you get a spike in LH and a spike in FSH that basically extrudes the egg into the fallopian tube. So that's your ovulation point. And that also is a company with an apex of estrogen where you're thickening up the uterine lining. Now at that particular point, LH and FSH go back down to their basal rate waiting for the next follicle cycle. But when you take a look at um, estrogen and progesterone, at this particular point, notice progesterone, once uh, ovulation has occurred, starts to maintain the uterine lining. So as estrogen goes up, it's thickening up the uterine lining, and that maintains the lining so that if you have a fertilized egg, it will be able to implant in the uterine lining, and you can have uh, implantation of pregnancy. However, if there is no fertilization, then eventually progesterone will go down. And then once it goes down, you will not be able to maintain that uterine lining anymore. It'll detach and slough off and you start it all over again. So that's basically the ovarian cycle. So essentially estrogen, just like, uh, just like and progesterone, just like testosterone is essentially associated with the secondary sex characteristics of females. For instance, axillary hair, pubic hair, uh, fat accumulation into the skin. Uh, both estrogen and progesterone are also necessary for breast development. Prolactin is basically a hormone coming off of the pituitary, I mean, of the pituitary that is essentially associated with lactation, and it's generally um, produced after pregnancy. And then oxytocin, which is a hormone coming off of the pituitary, that's made in the hypothalamus, released by the pituitary, actually is what creates the letdown of milk, so the delivery of milk when the baby begins to nurse, and it starts to create a positive feedback loop that allows the mother to continue to make milk in response to the demand of the baby. And so in females, uh, one of the skeletal um, situations is the pelvic girdle typically is wider and deeper in females, um, and it's a bit larger. So wider hips than males. Males have narrower hips, um, and there's a, there's a greater angle um, toward the knees. So it's a little more angular in males, a little more spread out in females. And so the reason for this is um, typically uh, for birth, right? So you can basically, um, the baby can fit through the um, pelvic girdle. That's typically what it's for. So now in menopause, right? But once you get to the other side, that usually happens between 40 and 55 or so. This is basically where your ovarian cycle ceases. So the, ovar the ovaries will no longer uh, respond to genetic 
nootropic uh, hormones. And so they don't secrete estrogen anymore or progesterone. And so at the onset of menopause, typically uh, menstruation becomes irregular. Um, and so ultimately menopause is done once menstruation has ceased for about a year or so. And of course, what's happening here is all your hormones, LH and FSH, the ones that you've been accustomed to all your life, they just kind of cease. And so hormonally, it's a, it's a massive shift. And so that's one of the reasons why menopause is, is a really big, is a really big deal. So the uterine cycle, essentially, um, this is a cyclic series of events associated with estrogen and progesterone. So a 28 day cycle, um, ultimately for a non-pregnant individual. So in days one through five, this is basically where we're going to be putting menstruation. So essentially low levels of both estrogen and progesterone. So there's really nothing there to maintain the endometrial thickness. And so that functional layer will basically detach from the basal layer, and then it'll essentially stop off. And so that's essentially the flow uh, that you get. So day six to 13 is what's called the proliferative phase. So this is basically where you begin to reproduce a new functional layer, generally associated with follicular development and also with estrogen production. So as the new follicle begins to increase, the estrogen will begin to thicken the endometrial liner, that functional layer. Um, it'll become more glandular in nature. Um, and then on day 14, roughly, we have ovulation. And so at this particular point, now we're waiting for fertilization. So that's from 15 to 28 is the secretory phase. Ultimately, this is where the corpus luteum will be producing progesterone. Um, and then causing and maintaining that endo endometrial thickness. And then the uterine glands um, will become as thick, they'll mature, they'll produce a thick secretion. And then ultimately your endometrium is ready for amputation of the embryo. The idea is if you've been fertilized at this particular point, then that embryo is busy tumbling down the fallopian tube on its way to the uterus for implantation. And then ultimately what will happen is the corpus luteum will regress and then it'll stop producing progesterone, which then causes the lack of maintenance of the endometrial lining, the attachment of that functional um, layer of the endometrium. And so this is just basically um, a, a table for exactly what we just mentioned there. So ultimately, when you take a look at fertilization and pregnancy, ultimately what happens is the male sperm will swim up the female reproductive tract from the cervix. It'll move into the, um, the uterus, swim up the uterus, up the fallopian tube to meet the egg. And then only one sperm is going to be fertilizing the egg, which will then create the zygote. So that is the single-celled individual, the single-celled baby offspring, who is um, a single cell of 46 chromosome. And so as the zygote is traveling down the uterine tube or the fallopian tube, it will begin its cleavage. It's beginning its divisions from one cell to two, from two to four, four to eight, and so forth. At this point, we refer to it as an embryo. And so the endometrium, because it's being maintained by the corpus luteum and the reduction of progesterone is now nice and thick and vascular, a lot of glands in there. So it's ready. It's prepared for implantation of the embryo. When the embryo reaches the uterus, it will implant into the endometrial lining. And then once it implants into the matrial lining, this is the beginning of pregnancy. Implantation is technically the beginning of pregnancy. And so uh, an abortion could be spontaneous, right? So that's basically a miscarriage or induced. Um, and so ultimately this would be the loss of the embryo or the fetus if either one of these happens. The placenta is basically a structure that sustains a developing embryo and all of its needs. And so this originates originally from both the maternal tissue and from fetal tissues. So typically what happens here is you get exchange between fetal cells and maternal blood. And at this particular point, once you create the placenta, you start to produce, or the female, the mother, starts to produce what's called human chorionic gonadotropin, or HCG, which maintains the corpus luteum, and which then maintains... the endometrial lining. This happens early on, right? So ultimately, this is one of the reasons why a lot of times pregnancy tests are detecting or trying to detect HCG. Because the idea is as soon as the embryo implants into the endometrial lining, 
it starts to stimulate HCG production, which produces progesterone and maintains corpus luteum. So you have constant maintenance of the endometrial lining. <clears throat> So ultimately, if you have more HCG, it stimulates your cor corpus, corpus luteum, the, pro uh, the progesterone, then will basically not just maintain the lining, but it also shuts down the thalamic pituitary responses and it'll shut down follicle stimulating hormone and LH hormone signals. So you're not developing any new follicles and you're also maintaining the uterine lining. This basically prevents menstruation, which is one of the reasons why one of the goals of pregnancy early on is missing that first, that first menstrual. And so this is kind of what it looks like. So at this particular point, what's gonna happen is your estrogen is going to, your FSH are gonna be working to start developing your follicle, and then estrogen will spike with ovulation as will LH, and then corpus luteum will begin a thickening or maintain the thickening of your uterine lining. And then once you get implantation, then the pregnancy will maintain through HCG, will maintain the thickness of the corpus, corpus luteum. And then this way, the baby will begin to form in the walls of that uterine lining. So ultimately the placenta produces a progesterone and some, so HCG will maintain the corpus luteum giving the placenta a chance to start organizing itself and producing its own progesterone. So now once that happens, then you have essentially the ability to let the corpus luteum go. It can regress, and then you can just maintain your placenta by itself. So the placenta becomes self-sustaining at some point. So when you take a look at things like birth control pills, typically um, what happens with these is they prevent pregnancy by taking um, pills that contain estrogen and progesterone uh, for 21 days, and then inactive pills that don't contain them for like seven days. So what happens is the uterine lighting builds up while the active pills are being taken. So basically tricking your system into thinking you're pregnant when you're not, right? And then ultimately what happens is uh, progesterone decreases after the last active pills are taken, and that causes um, menstruation. So then ultimately, uh, it's kind of like tricking your system into thinking that it's pregnant. So ultimately what happens is you basically take something high in estrogen. So it thinks it's uh, ovulated and it's also um, actively maintaining. So it's thinking HCG is maintaining thickness. And so you're tricking the body into thinking it's pregnant. And then what happens is that feeds back and inhibits follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone from queuing up follicular development. Okay, and that is the end of chapter 17.